Right, guys, something a little bit different for you uh, this week. Uh, this week, we, we celebrate our one year anniversary of our first podcast with uh, Simon Mann, an old colleague and ex boss of ours uh, that we're still in touch with. And Simon joined us today to celebrate 52 podcasts in 52 weeks, which back in uh, June 2020, Alan, uh, probably seemed uh, a little bit of an optimistic challenge. <laughs> You're not wrong. A year ago, I would have never thought would have done 52 podcasts or even done any podcasts, if you're going to say that to start. <laughs> and, and when we started out, didn't we, we just, we started writing articles during lockdown and reflecting on the work we'd done on a, on a fairly long career so far, uh, getting into webinars, presenting the stuff that we'd done. And then we thought, oh, why not? Let's give it a go. We've, we've listened to a few podcasts in the past. Shall we, shall we start our own? And then 52 episodes later, here we are. Great effort, eh? I think it is. Simon, thanks for joining us. Hey, my pleasure. Um, just reflecting on that, Alan, I think one of the things that has been interesting over the past year, you said we talked about reflections and we talked about articles that we've written. We've we found ourselves in numerous conversations, especially you with starting your masters, around sharing anecdotal conversations, uh, sharing articles which essentially were opinion uh, pieces and discussions and also trying to look at where research comes into that. How, how has your master's changed that perception? Because a lot of the work we've done, it is anecdotal, it is based on our experience, um, and there is research to back some of it up and, and, and not others. How has your master's influenced your thoughts on that as we've gone through this year? Yeah, great question. It, if anybody's wanting to know about learning, anybody's wanting to think, challenge yourself, <laughs> go and do a master's because it's bloody hard. <laughs> but it is... It, it has really started to get me to question where knowledge comes from. And, and you're right, our opinion is just one opinion. And we can see on, on, on Twitter that there's so many vast ranging opinions. The leadership books that we used to revere and, and, and that we still really love reading. You're thinking, well, what's their, what's their prerogative for, for writing those? It's, it's usually profit, isn't it? And it's usually their own experience of being in the army or in business. And, what I'd like to look at there is then education in context and, and, and Simon's pretty skilled in looking at leadership as an, as an educational theme. But, but from my perspective of a, as an individual learning point is that you're never, still, never too old to stop learning. And I think that's the key here is that you're on that continual learning journey. And just that little analogy of when I learned to skateboard at Christmas at 43 without doing too much damage, that was just a great example of just learning something from scratch and just giving it a go and I think that's been a big theme hasn't it from our, from our podcast that the people we've interviewed they've not sat in their comfort zones they've given it a go and and that that Chris Seal just do it attitude from from Nike is is the key to this what do you think Simon yeah no I mean I'm, I concur I probably when I started my master's which was I think I was probably in my mid 30s and I'd avoided it because I felt I was too busy in it and it kind of I think the thing that really sort of struck me was it really began to get me to understand how much I didn't know um you know <laughs> and really sort of stopped me in my tracks and, and and there was a kind of a mixture of what I didn't know and beginning to understand what I needed to know but also that thing about you read some stuff and it just feels intuitively right and, and a lot of the things so you talk about leadership books and then you look at things like cognitive science and you look at leadership theory and you look at um you know things like assessment and, and and the way in which we interact with students and relationship theory and it and, and the more you look and i think this is the really interesting thing about um being in context is it's about making the links and it's about it's about it's about linking the theory and, and the problem with the university theory is it's very siloed so it will be it, and research is usually in one context so it's about trying to link those things up you find and learn about um, with reality, understanding why things work when they work, recognising that sometimes you think something's working, but actually it probably isn't longer term. Um, and it's just almost using it as a mirror to kind of look at what you're doing and, and the way you're functioning uh, and a background that, that influences what you do, but can't kind of dictate what you do because as, as we may explore, you know, you, you've spoken to 52 leaders um, all have very different perspectives, some of which, having looked at your notes, I would, I would concur with thoroughly. Others I've kind of, some of the sound bites I'd sort of, we'll maybe explore some, uh, 
we'll explore some questions about that. But it's the context <laughs> that's the uh, the fun bit, and it's the thinking on your feet, and it's the working through things, but doing it with research in the background. So that that master's level study, and I'm going to say this, and I've said it said it before. Don't take a master's in leadership. Go and take a master's in education. Understand the business. The leadership can stuff. Combine them, Simon. Living. Can you combine them? <laughs> my, my you can. Team. You can. My problem <laughs> with leadership is unless you know where you're going, what you're leading, and you understand the business you're leading in, it's a waste of time and actually it can be damaging because you learn how to lead people where you're not actually leading them anywhere. And I think that's the thing that worries me. And this like MPQH, SQH, HPQ, the MPQR, it just... it. Unless you know your business, it's it's just another qualification that, that you know, as Brenny Brown says, really easy to learn about leadership, really hard to lead. And I think you've got to understand your business, your industry. Um, and I've often said, you've heard me say it, don't, you know, don't rush up the ladder because what, what you leave behind by getting up the ladder too quick, you'll never get back. Um, you know. I know you mentioned Brené Brown there. I was, I was reading um, the Daring Greatly book again the other day. And it's one I, I, I revisit every now and again. And one of the things she mentions in there is very much what we're talking about here, that research is contextual. Qualitative, qualitative research is just as important as quantitative research, but often seen as a little bit softer, a bit fluffier, a little bit less scientific. And I think one of the things that we're starting to agree on here, and, and one of the things I've, I've really learned over the last 52 weeks is that there is research, um, there is anecdotes, there is discussion, there is experience. And like you say, it's trying to find and extract the right things for the context that you're in. One size doesn't fit all. And in some ways, that's an analogy that doesn't tell the whole story, but it isn't even one size doesn't fit all. It's, it, it's one size might help a, a series of different contexts in different ways, but it's trying to divide that into a way that's right right now. A more operational, uh, a more operational parts of your role, and, and maybe trying to find the right strategies moving forward that benefit in education, students, parents, um, and teachers. And I think that's what's very different with a lot of the leadership research you're referring to, or that kind of idea of not doing leadership is is that educational based, is that context based. And I know Alan, your leadership masters at the moment is around education. And, and are you finding that you've still got those points where you're like, well, actually, that isn't relevant in my context. That isn't right for my school. Well, yeah, yeah, you're totally right. And I think there's a phrase that, that gets banded around about leadership is is caught rather than taught. I mean, I don't know if you guys can, can remember a decent leadership course you've actually been on. And that's no disrespect to anything you've led, Simon, or anything like that. But the best times were learning from people like Simon and being in situations where you have to just do and be involved and learn from that situation. Would we agree? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I was just thinking as you were talking then, it's like, um, so I would add to what you said, Lewis, and I said the decision has to be right for the now, but it also has to be right longer term as well. Because if we solve a problem and we don't do it with a bigger context in mind, quite often what we do is we create a problem. And I think you see that all the time. You know, you, you're solving a problem. And it's that bit about having a vision of where it's going and, and, and just using that as a filter for almost every decision, every conversation you have. And it sounds really manipulative and really kind of, but it, it kind of has to sit there. It has to be in your mind. That's that kind of, it's the moral imperative. It's the reason you're doing what you're doing. Um, and, and so I, I, that's what that's what I I was just thinking about, you know, leadership. I don't know if you remember this, but a while ago, it was this constant eat the frog. If you've got an issue you had to deal with, get it out the way early doors. And I would say just don't, because quite often you're getting it out the way early doors to get to get something off your own plate and the timing could be completely wrong. You know, I would say eat the frog when it walks past you. You know, <laughs> wait, wait, wait till it presents, yourself, presents itself, obviously, and then you can deal with it in context. Otherwise, quite often you're having abstract conversations. Do you remember when or so-and-so told me this? So, you know, store your frogs up and just eat them when they uh, when they arrive. And that and I think that's a much more humane and, and much more kind of people-centred approach to leadership because it, it, it avoids the uh, the disconnect between what you're trying to talk about and, and what people see. Um, and I love that. I love the leadership's core. I'd say the same about really positive attributes, you know, as we develop attributes in schools and in students, things like, you know, empathy, resilience, you can teach them, you can, you can develop places where they will emerge, but you're actually catching it and you're going, that's what we're talking about. And you're reflecting on, on that and you're sharing that as a sort of small story as an anecdote. And so, yeah, I, I love that. I haven't really heard that expression before, but I really like it. it resonates with me. 
I think a lot of this, Simon, with with leadership and you're talking about catching the frog as it as it goes past, that comes very much back to connection and knowing your knowing your staff. Yeah. And I think we've had a lot of we've had a lot of good leadership, uh, not gurus, but people who have been experienced in leadership that have talked about that. We've had Mike Gilmore, we've had Kent Pakel, who I know you've done a lot of work around the the, the connections that he makes through the the the, the four S's, isn't it? And, and I know we had personal experience of that in in my school this year, where at the start of the year it was all about the four S's. It wasn't about Oh, well, what's the lesson content at the start? We needed to get to know people in a new school, and that then led to quality being produced because you know that person. I mean, you've worked a lot with Ken, and you working in a school now, Simon. That you've had to go and take a role that's a very different role to what you normally do is as a caretaker, almost caretaker boss, interim boss. How, how did that go with you knowing you're only going to be there a year and trying to develop those relationships? Yeah, I hate saying that's a really good question because everyone knows that's just a stalling tactic. Um, <laughs> I think what I thought I was going to do and what I did were different, but I think anyone who knows me is kind of wouldn't be surprised by that. Um, the relationships have been actually the most difficult thing, um, not so much because we haven't been in, because mainly we have been in. Um, but there's been two things that have kind of created barriers to that. One's One's the fact that when I arrived, I think um, it would be fair to say there, were, there was a fair amount of anxiety in the room um, due to the experience that the school had had before the summer with actually having a quite significant COVID outbreak then going into distance learning and then going on break and having Singapore's a very interesting place for, for, for teachers to be stuck. You know, it, it sounds quite idyllic, but it's very small and it can get quite oppressive. And a lot of our teachers haven't left, but it's going to come up two years now. Um, and it's a very small island. You can cycle around this island in the morning. Um, and so there was anxiety in the room and anxiety about what was coming and how it was going to play out. So that was one thing that I think probably inhibited some of the relationship building. Um, and the other bit was the masks. It just, I, I, I actually watched something recently and it, I can't remember the exact term, but it's micro. It's basically these very, very small, as we're talking, we're watching each other for these very small cues. Um, and when they get removed, actually, the brain is searching for them. You know that thing on your on your phone where you, you it completely runs down if you get on a plane because it, it just and you don't put it on airplane mode. It's just it's constantly searching for uh, for a Wi-Fi connection that's not there. Well, it's a little bit like that in your brain. And actually, the masks don't only detract from the information you're getting from the people, but they're actually making you more tired because your brain is subconsciously searching for them. Um, and I. I can't remember how many conversations I've had where I thought I talked to someone before or I did talk to someone before and kind of missed it um, because of the masks um, and actually the relationship. So I've had this habit of, of when we have meetings, we put water on the table because in Singapore, if you're drinking you can t or eating, you can take your mask off so I can actually see who I'm talking to. Um, but relationships, absolutely at the fore, trying to work out where people are at to try and work out when the next thing is. Um, and I think fairly fairly quickly as I got in. We, we, had, we had a clear, uh, but, but with Chris Short, who's done a fantastic job with school prior to my arrival, um, and Craig and, and Cara, who are the respective heads, we, 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 we decided we were going to go at wellbeing hard, um, and we did. Um, and we really focused on wellbeing of, of ourselves and our teachers, and I think that paid dividends. Um, I don't know how my relationships are with a lot of staff because I don't just don't get the level of connection, um, probably because I've only been in a short time, but also, the limitations of movement. Um, I hope they're good. Um, I hope they will be good with some, they'll be less good with others. I'm sure that's the case in most situations. Um, but I think it is trying to develop a level of confidence maybe in the decisions that are being made and, and the leading that's going on. And from an interim perspective, my, I, I kind of sort of viewed my job as helping the school think about its next steps rather than, rather than nailing all those next steps down. So placing it in a situation where it can go through it the next phase of sustainable change. And I've been working with Richard Dyer on what that might look like. I've been working with the leadership team, digging into things they want to do, um, digging into things that I think might add to that and maybe helping a little bit with strategy about where you start that and, and, and the, the less is more. Just try to sort of strip back what we were doing to a few things that cover a lot of things rather than a lot of things that confuse people. Yeah, it's been, I've, I've loved it. Amazing year, amazing year. 
Stripping back has been a, a common theme, hasn't it? And I think in every department, in every school, we're just trying to identify those things that are most important. And I know that you've got um, you've got some questions and some areas you want to explore with us, Simon, um, around the last 52 weeks. So listen, over to you. Let's crack on and uh, let, let's try and see what we can pull out of 52 weeks of learning. <laughs> okay, so the worm has turned. You are under the posh, <laughs> gentlemen. Right, I'm going to start with uh, start with you, Lewis. I want, I want you to go really big picture. What are the really big things? And, and I think you're going, to, you're going to be linking in the interviews you've done over the last 52 weeks with your personal experience. What are the big picture things you've learned about? And let's maybe start about yourself um, and then we'll move on to the idea of, of leadership and how you're functioning in, in your current environment, which I know has been one that open, closed, open, closed, you know, must have been incredibly challenging to come into um, as a new a new member of the school it has um it has it's, it's been hard I'll, I'll start with me in terms of to, in terms of what i've learned um my perspective on on talking about leadership on talking about learning has changed immensely over the past year and it's gone from feeling as if i shouldn't be talking about it because i don't know all the answers to becoming a lot more comfortable with the fact that no one does know all the answers and, and, and all I'm doing is sharing an opinion and, and I'm sharing things from, from the context I've encountered and experienced around people that I know and the relationships that I've had, you know, applying and exploring research in different ways. Um, and I think I would have been very defensive or very sort of, um, I'd have really tried to explain myself a lot more a year ago if you'd have asked me that question I, I would have really clambered and tried to clutch at different things to try and prove that I'm right and be worried about whether I'm right and and I think that's changed a lot I think I'm a, a much more open book in terms of learning much more aware of that there isn't necessarily a textbook correct way to do anything in any context because context and people are so different um, I, I was always very aware that education and leading was a people business and, and that people mattered. And, and I don't think I could have been at a better school previously in, in the last seven years than, than BSM to, to learn that in terms of well-being and to learn relationships with people. The Philippines is a country that thrives and, and builds itself and everything it does on relationships. You can't get anywhere or do anything without them. And it really makes you slow down and consider that just in everyday exchanges with people um, in, in conversations that you have with people that you don't know, with support staff in school, with teachers from different departments and with your colleagues. And that allows you to be in a position and a environment where conversations comfortable and open and honest. And I really, really enjoyed that. And, and that's helped me to, to really push on and understand that that's something that I'm about. I think the work Alan and I did right at the beginning when we started to write was very much around making sure we understood who we were before we shared our opinions with other people. And I don't think I can underestimate the importance of knowing who you are. So often in education, there's, there's this assumption that some of it is acting and some of it's a show. And to some extent, I agree with that. To get up in front of a class and to to infuse a year one class in PE maybe is a persona that you wouldn't use in your office. But it's in context, that's correct. And I think who you are is really important in that process. You can walk around the school, any school at any time, and you'll see staff with their head down, not willing to communicate, not wanting to say hello. And for me, that's a confidence issue. And, and I think knowing who you are gives you confidence to be who you want to be. And I think that if you can mix that with some self-efficacy in terms of contextual, specific confidence in teaching, in learning, in leadership, or whatever it is, with some humility and with some acceptance that you don't know all the answers, but you want to work towards them, I think you're going to set yourself up to be in a really good position. And that certainly helped me in a difficult year in, in moving to a new school with new teams across two campuses during a pandemic has, has been hard. Um, but having that sort of assurance and that sort of time that Alan and I had to really explore what our own values are and who we were ourselves has been really important. So in, in summary, essentially for me, knowing who I am has, has helped me incredibly over the last 12 months. And that's something I'm really keen on exploring more and seeing how I can support colleagues and, and, and other people around that process. 
and also knowing and, and having that reinforcement that, that people are really important and being humble and knowing that you don't have all the answers and that's all right as long as you're willing to learn and, and grow from it. In a nutshell, that's where I say I am and, and, and where I've made the, the most learning and the most progress in the last year. All right, I'm going to stop you there and I'm just going to throw those ideas over to Alan and we'll come back to the uh, what you've learned from the podcast and, and, and afterwards. Alan, your thoughts on, I mean, Lewis has talked about people, honesty and openness, being yourself, knowing who you are um, and, and how, and not always having the answers, but being open to opinion and ideas. And he did actually mention research in there as well. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's something we all agree on. So your thoughts about those sort of themes, Alan, and, and, and how your years panned out and what you've learned about yourself over this year. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think Lewis is exactly right. That, that process we went through of, of reflection right at the start of lockdown and knowing who we were and writing down our core values, writing down our non-negotiables, what we expect. I think that was really powerful. And, and I'm just going to take it back a step because this all comes back to your roots. And I often, when I, when I get back to the UK, I'll go and walk around my old council estate. I'll show the kids where I'm from. I'll go and do stuff that I did when I were a kid. And I don't really know why I do that. <laughs> it's just something I'd go and do. And I think it's almost like, well, this is where I'm from. And now I've done all right, haven't I? And I were trying to process that. And I think I've been hampered by my roots. I'm going to be quite honest here and be quite vulnerable. And, and a few years ago, I've never done that. Um, I've realised that coming from where I come from, what I've done probably shouldn't have happened. It's quite, it's quite weird. I, I sort of, I, I look at the council estate and I look at the people that are there and they're great people, but they haven't, they're still there. And, and I feel like when I go and see that, I think, oh, I, am I a stranger now in this place where I grew up? Because I've gone so far away from that place. But it comes back to then the values of growing up there, going to a really tough school. And I remember last summer, just, just before I left for, to go to Saudi, I sat in the hairdresser's chair. And my hairdresser, I've known my hairdresser since he was 11 years old. He, is that is that a barber, Alan, or is it a hairdresser? I'm just, just a barber. All right, a barber. All right, okay. Just, just trying to work on it. <laughs> so he, he, I was sat in the chair, and he's got his, he's got his own business, and he, he's done it. We talked about, we, we, we talked about the journey, like our school. What did we actually learn at our school? And for me, it wasn't examinations because not many people left that place with decent GCSEs. We talked about the things that we did learn from that school, and that was being able to deal with difficult situations, deal with people who aren't particularly very nice, but but on a level that we actually can, can get on with them. And I think that I took that forward and the hard work and the graft of getting out of that situation. I've took all those good values forward, but also I think there's been things there where there's a confidence thing where you've been in that situation that's not great. So you don't, and if you believe that you can go on and do really good things, do you get what I mean? So yeah, absolutely. You know what, I'll, I'll link it to exactly the same sort of context. You go home for, for, for Christmas as a prime example, and you'll go in the local pub and you'll be having a few pints and someone will come in and you went to school with, or you know, you obviously haven't seen since the last time you were back in England and you haven't spoken to since. And, and they'll say, oh, you're, you're living abroad, right? Yeah, I am, yeah. And they're absolutely intrigued. And for 10 minutes, all they're asking is, well, what's it like? How do you do that? Where do you live? You know, how do you get your, your Vimto and your sausages and whatever, <laughs> whatever else it is? And, and you don't realise the, the, how big a deal that is for some people and how big a deal it was for us when we first did it. And it does, it humbles you a little bit because it makes you realise the, the chance and the risk that you took to go away and do that. And when you, you didn't really know anyone who'd done it, you know, you didn't have a team of friends abroad that were waiting for you saying, come and, come and have a job. You know, you, you didn't really know anybody. You took a chance and you spoke to somebody who maybe you knew in a school or that had worked abroad. You asked what their experiences were. And when you go back to the UK now and people ask you about it, they're absolutely amazed. They don't even know where it is that you're talking about. They think that wherever that city is, they live in bamboo huts. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's really trying to make them aware of that. that there is, there is a, a world and a life outside where you live at the moment. 
And I don't think there's anything wrong with staying where you're from. Absolutely not at all. But it's just that awareness of that there are different cultures and different lives in different pockets of the world that are there to be explored should you want to do that. And, and for me, doing that has, has really opened my eyes in, in, in many different ways. But you know what, Lois? I think, I think it took a long time for me to, re to rewire myself that I'm not in fight or flight mode. I honestly think that on reflection now, because you, you go and work as a teacher in, in local comps that you've are very similar to what you've gone to and you're still in fight or flight. It, it takes you a long time. And it's, I'd say it's only in the past sort of five, five sort of years or when I started working with you guys and, and you, Simon, that you can actually admit that you're a little bit vulnerable and you can make mistakes and you can actually be authentic. And I think before that, it's all a bit of a, as you talked about, bit of an act until you know yourself and you can really start to then develop the way you want to be. And it's okay to be like that. It, it's okay. And I, and I think that's, that's where we're at now, where I feel fairly comfortable in my own skin and realize I can do more. And, and this year has enabled me to do that. I've gone on and done my masters, which you always told me to do, Simon. I, I've stepped up into the assistant head role at, at my current school. I, I've always, it's always been in me, but I don't think I had the confidence to take it forward. And I think this year's done that for me. So that, that's been my biggest takeaway for this year. What, what changed it then? What, what did give you the confidence to do it? Can you try and point to one or two things? Yeah. I think I, think I know what you're going to say here. And I, and I think that I will probably agree with you. But it'd be really interesting to hear. I, I, well, doing the things we did at the start, then speaking to people across the world who then actually think, whoa, hang on a minute, these... He's all right. He knows what he's he knows what he's on about. He's is a I won't say an expert, but he's he's good in his field. The, the the stuff that producing are good, and that gives you so much confidence. And then just having these conversations with people, and they're affirming things that you think, and you think, oh yeah, that's great. But I can challenge that as well. And then it's this melting pot of ideas, and then you put the masters on top, and suddenly your brain's full <laughs> and, you, and you're applying everything to context and you've just got so much bank of knowledge to then use in that journey going forward. And, and that's what's given me the huge confidence, I think. But the big one there that you've touched upon, um, and I might be presuming here or I might be making an assumption, is that idea of letting yourself do the things that you're doing without judging yourself, without telling yourself you can't do it, without telling yourself yeah, yeah. I should be somewhere else, I'm not worthy of yeah, no, you, you, you're completely right. And we, we've called it imposter syndrome before, haven't we? And there's, there's lots of terms out there. Um, yeah, it, it's about believing that you, yeah. you, you're in that place and you deserve to be in that place. And probably, yeah, I, I've started to believe that I deserve to be there. I think in, in some, some schools where you're seeing all these highly intelligent people, you think, oh, I'm not quite there. And like when we've been working with Julie Stern, Lewis, and all those people, you think, wow, I, I'm... I'm not quite as intelligent as these people, but there's other qualities that you bring to the table where you can utilise people who are highly intelligent, but you can tie it all together in a simplified manner. That's the way I've sort of thought about it now. That's, that's my superpower. I can tie things together quite simply and then bring it to the table. I, I, I kind of, I have a real problem with that idea of thinking that other people are more intelligent in the room. Um, I think that's, uh, I think so often that's used as a shield by people. Um, and you see people using it as a vehicle to kind of push back against other people. Um, and and I, I completely agree with you, Alan. I'm going to throw a curveball at you in the moment. You're not ready to, <laughs> oh, to back to that. We call it a um, cluster bomb, Simon. We haven't been yeah. cluster bomb for ages. No, it's about time we were. Um, <laughs> but I think I, th I, I, I get the imposter syndrome, and I think we've all experienced it. And I think who we are contextually, I mean, I, I always think about when I went to Garden and, and uh, all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I, everywhere I went, I walked into kids and parents and I had to sort of get up and have a shave before I went to the supermarket, which is, you know, weekends, you know what I'm like, I'm a scruff, um, <laughs> you know, but these things, it didn't change me as a person. It just made me recognise, given the position I'm in, I'm just going to have to function slightly differently. And I think that's also important. And I also think for me, um, the imposter syndrome, which I also, you know, experience and you, you, suddenly you, you have to, um, it keeps me honest. It makes me question myself. I'm at my worst when I'm at my most confident, you know, and I need to kind of draw myself in. And I think it's not a bad thing. It's a bad thing when it's it's debilitating. And I think it's a bad thing when it's not there. And I think somewhere it's like everything else, a bit of it 
makes you a better person. It makes you a, it makes you a softer person. I, I tell you what, if I if if I had an hour to speak about something, it would be that one statement you meant, mentioned there, Alan. And I think it kind of underpins everything we do. What did we learn at school? Yeah. And we could have a conversation about what we should be learning at school, um, because as we know, it's got to be way more than academic results. But that's something we could come to another time. Right, Alan, I'm going to throw something at you. Someone said of said of you recently, you've really softened this year. Um, you've become much more people. You've, you've become much more people focused and much more. Um, you've almost the your year's experience has almost given yourself a window. And, and, and you know, and, and, and I just want I just be interested in your in your comments on that comment about you. And I thought it was a fa a fantastic compliment. Um, so it's not. I'm just I'm just. Uh, what what do you think about that? And that's, that's, a, that's that's the one really I've got. Nice compliment. It's a really nice compliment, and and it was certainly something that I was looking towards, and it was just reading. And you, it was a comment you said. It's a, the education to people business. It's always stuck with me, and and then hearing more and more affirmation of that, and and learning that about connection is everything. And yes, it's a, you're exactly right. I made a, a massive effort to go down the connection line because I've realised how important that is, and. I, the, the the conversation with Mike Gilmore's really stuck with me about it, the prison story when he went into a prison and he's just saying hey hey to names he was work to trying to get people's attention and the prison warden said to him just learn their names just learn their names and you'll get so much more from them and and it's that dehumanizing because when you're in a leadership position and there's these stories of power into it, leadership and power are very much linked together. People see you differently to actually what you see yourself. So they, they, you're on this almost on a pedestal and I don't like using that word and I don't like that method of leadership where you're this hierarchical, but the way people perceive you is that you're up there. And I think I wanted to soften that down and make sure that I knew absolutely everybody in the school that, there was connection with everybody that I was being authentic and listening more. And, and also that those itches that, that Chris Seal talks about, it's knowing what to scratch at what time. I really love that. And so I have made a concerted effort and I do feel uh, a lot better about that, Simon. And, and certainly softening the edges, I think it, it's helped me as a person as well, without a doubt, as a dad, as a husband, all the way. If somebody had said to you 10 years ago, Alan, that you've softened, would that have been a positive thing? Probably not, mate. No, I, I, probably not. I'd have probably seen it as a sign of weakness, to be quite honest, because you have this perception of leadership and it's only when you work with really good leaders and see what see what can be done and read and hear and speak that you then realise, I'm gone a minute. Come on, stop being a dick. <laughs> <laughs> and I, Just, I think that, that whole thing about vulnerability is so important. You've got to put yourself out there. You've got to tell the bad stories about yourself along with the good stories. And I think that's true of teachers to kids. And I think that's true of leaders to teams. I'm just going to share with you one of my, it goes back to the Kent Paco stuff. And we were doing, uh, we were using them as a vehicle to connect up with, um, with each of our teachers early doors this year. And I had two, I don't know if I told this story, but I had two of the most amazing conversations this year as a result of the Ken Paco stuff. And they were with two uh, members of staff who didn't know me from Adam, who um, who were just so open and honest. And we uh, and, and I talked to them, we, we got into, it was about the, um, it, it was about the strengths and the things that they'd experienced. And they both talked about, so one of them was um, of Chinese heritage and uh, her family had come in and spent the whole of lockdown period with them. Um, and she said to me, and we finally learned to talk to each other properly. We're in a small apartment and we actually have to now communicate. Before it was parents, you do what you're told. I, I was building my relationship with my child and also building my relationship with my parents. And she said, it's been transformational. And I thought the fact that she was able to share that with me was just, I was just honored. But I just thought, what a, what a fantastic comment. And the other was a woman whose husband, she, she described him as a, a workaholic. And she said, this is this is just stopped him in his tracks. And he's realized that he has to have time for his family. He has to have time for his son. He has to have time for me. And it's it's adjusted. And again, this moment of being able to share. And and I, I that that made me feel very honored. But I also think that, that this this is where those 
conversations based on those four S's start, dig, you know, digging way below the surface. You know, that thing, we I've had a great conversation early doors at this school. Oh, yeah, we kind of know everybody. And I, I kind of I question that as, as, as you would, would, would expect me to. And we do. But we might know them to have a cup of coffee. We might know them because we know they've got a four-year-old. We might know. But do we really know them? Yeah. Do we know what makes them tick? Because until we know what makes them tick, and I think you, Lewis, you talked about this way back, until we know what makes them tick, we can't pick the things that are going to make them better and support them and 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 find ways of of, of presenting the information in a manner that's going to be most uh, most likely to be absorbed. So yeah, really cool. And I think it was a massive compliment, Alan. So that would be uh, my perspective. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, Lewis, in terms of your start in a, in a new school as well. How important were, was connection there? And, and, and as Simon has just alluded to, is it contrived or are you getting to that deeper level in order to get the best from people? How, how, how hard's that been in a, in a year where you're online and offline and all sorts of things going on? Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a really interesting journey. I think the key thing to mention there, we, we've said it a couple of times, is people are people and then everybody's slightly different. So you, you go at a pace that you feel sort of suits you to start with. You, you, you try and see what the pace is to get to know people and you quickly get signs as to whether you need to slow down and, and whether there's boundaries being crossed or whether actually that's welcome and that people do have open conversations and everybody's slightly different. Some people, as Simon alluded to there, given an opportunity will be open um, and, and will really share details that will really help you know that person a little bit better. Some people see work as something very different to their life and, and that they don't want those two sort of areas to merge. And you get that impression that you, you, you don't, uh, that, that people don't want to share quite so much. So I've had some, some of that, um, you know, some, some stuff in terms of relationships, you really feel like you're making um, some real connections with and some real progress with. Um, and other staff, that takes a little bit longer. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think that's a negative. Um, and I think one of the things that I've really started to understand is that the pace of that probably um, relates to the fact that that person might have had different things that's gone on in their past that has meant that they, they need to have a, a situation where they're slowing down and getting to know people. And, and you can't rush that. You know, you can't rush that. So in short... Yeah, in terms of relationships, you know, there's always progress to be made and, and the sort of online versus face-to-face -face stuff has made it very, very tough. Um, but having said that, there's still opportunities to have those conversations. There's still opportunities to make those connections. I often, I, as you were really, as you were talking way back, both of you about, uh, about this year, and I, I wonder whether the fact we've been forced online for so many things has, has actually made this... Uh, more attainable um, and and more more valuable. Um, it, 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 it shifted my perception of how we might interact across the world. Obviously, I mean, I, one of the things that really sits heavily with me is the environmental uh, issues we're facing and the amount of time potentially someone like me, if I carry on with consultancy, is going to spend on planes and other ways we can avoid that. And I wonder whether that's also maybe create a bit of space, create a bit of time, create a bit of thinking, and also create a little bit of doing things slightly differently. Um, not perfect. We all, we'd all rather be face-to-face, -face, but maybe sufficiently good. Um, and that's just something that I kind of reflected on as you were talking earlier about this idea of your podcast series. And I wonder whether that's something that's influenced it. But that's not my next question. <laughs> my next question, and you've kind of dug into this a little bit, and I'll start, I'll come back to Lewis. Things that have jumped out of you um, in these series of uh, series of podcasts you've put together and, and the different people that you've spoken to, the things that you've really... It's kind of your personal takeaway uh, or takeaways at this time, Lewis. Um, in terms of personal takeaways, there's been loads. Um, some of those are affirmations. Some of those are real sort of light bulb moments in terms of what people are capable of and decisions that you make and the effects that they have and... Just to sort of pick out a few, I know we mentioned Kent Peckle a few times, we were aware of his work before we had a conversation with him, but that idea of really trying to get to know people goes back to that, that sort of theory that I came up with earlier about knowing who you are and what you're about is only going to help you in your role and it's only going to help you lead a life that 
allows you to flourish. And flourish is one of those buzzwords at the minute, isn't it, with all the positive psychology going on. But if we don't have a situation where we know ourselves well, we're not going to be in a position where we're going to be healthy people. Um, and we need to be healthy people to be able to educate the children and to lead good schools um, and to, to lead schools well. So I think it's really important that it comes back to who you are. Um, I know we've mentioned it already, Ter Terry Gormley's sort of message of uh, you'll never get it wrong if you do the right thing. I really like and I know there are there are kinks in that that you're keen to, to point out to us, Simon. But that general ethos and idea of trying to make the decision that's right for the people involved, and sometimes that makes you popular, sometimes it makes you unpopular. John Gwynne Jones talked really well about learning from leaders, both those that you respect and that allow you to, uh, to work in the way you want, and also those that don't, because you'll be able to pull something from both of those areas. He also talks about cultures and backgrounds and and how respecting the culture and the background that people are from is going to help, which really links to that idea of what we're talking about, of knowing who it is that you're working with and, and where they're from and, and, and what helps and supports them and how you can do that better. There, there's a whole host of other bits and bobs that I've pulled out, as you can imagine. You know, you, you do have these conversations every week with people, and Al and I are, are, are really honoured. It's, it's an absolute pleasure every week to sit down with somebody and just listen to their theories and their ideas on different bits and bobs. We spoke to an ex-Sheffield United player, Bob Bucko, who talked about corners and edges, and I loved that. You know, he talked about how he, he gave the lads um, a changing room to go and clean, and, and he'd specifically check the corners and the edges. And that would give him a reflection of their own personal pride and, and the pride they took in their job. Did they get the dust and the rubbish out of the corners and were the edges sorted as well? And I really, really liked that one. And I thought it was a bit old school and really simple. Um, Alistair McCaw talked a lot to us about his leadership theories um, and about how actually ego isn't necessarily the enemy. And you need a bit of ego to have some confidence as long as that ego is in the right place and it, it is situated in a way where it isn't necessarily the most important thing in your leadership, but it's it's an aspect of it. He said it could be a real, real positive because that means that you're doing things that you are proud of and you're not allowing things to happen that aren't necessarily what would you, or that don't really meet the standards that you have yourself. Um, a couple of others that I will mention, um, just that, that stick with me really well, James Coppinger, um, you know, he's played hundreds and hundreds of games at professional football level and he just talked about simply reframing his mindset and when he was in troubled times and difficult times just taking a moment to think right okay how can I look at this a different way um, and he talked about a really cool practice which um, I'm really keen on exploring actually which is the idea of of you almost in the third person looking at yourself sat on a chair and asking yourself what do you see there what is it that you see? Yes, you see a person sat in a chair, but break that down. What are the attributes of that person? What are the weaknesses? What are the anxieties and the vulnerabilities? And that was some of the great work he did with Terry Gormley, which led to us obviously chatting to Terry Gormley on the pod. Um, and then more recently, um, Mike Gilmore talked fantastically about building rapport, but trying to do that in a way that wasn't contrived and trying to do that with real a real genuine approach, which I think is difficult. Uh, and I think you'll always have people that feel quite defensive and you'll always have people that feel like you've crossed a boundary and they don't want to be telling you and being open with you. But it's being consistent in trying to support and help them as best you can. And I think over time that helps. And that's one of the things that I think uh, has been a struggle for, for school leaders and people everywhere over this last year with COVID has been that lack of connection, those sort of... Um, water dispenser chats that you have, those conversations you have walking to lessons, those jokes that you share when you're in the office. Without those, I think communication has become a lot more matter of fact and it's become a lot more exchange of information rather than an, an art and a tool to help us connect with one another. And I think that's a real shame. And I think Zoom has helped, um, but it isn't the same. You mentioned earlier about masks, picking up nuances in facial expressions. I think Zoom's the same in a two-dimensional screen. You, you don't get a feel for a person you're speaking to and you don't connect in the way that you would like to, but it's uh, it, it's better than nothing. And I think that's helped us in some ways. Um, I, I'll mention just one more um, before I pass over to, uh, to Alan. And, and that was just a really uplifting conversation we had a little while ago with Susie Stevens from New Zealand. Susie is a an XPE teacher and she's now doing a PhD in happiness which is right up your street in terms of uh, well-being and trying to measure that 
And she talked so passionately about this same kind of idea of reflecting and knowing yourself. If you don't know yourself, how can you impact children as best you can? You have to know how you tick to get the best out of yourself, to, to, to be in any way near getting the best out of the children that you lead and that you teach. Um, and she talked about that being you know, quite a tough process of really taking time to think about it and then looking at how that influences your practice. Now, from a PE point of view, she spoke about that a cool analogy of, you know, if a, a drug wasn't working on a specific illness, um, you wouldn't keep giving and administering that drug. So, so why do we keep shoving a curriculum down children's throats that isn't really fit for purpose? Um, and that helps you to reflect on your practice, which in turn helps you to reflect on how you do the things you do, which in turn helps you to reflect on who you are. So that was a really, really cool conversation. She touched upon the idea that language is really important and that, which sort of fed into Greg Dreyer's episode and a, and a book that Daryl Mickle spoke to us about around the tyranny of words. It's a book written in the 30s by a guy called Stuart Chase. A phenomenal book to read in terms of how a misuse of language or how our perceptions of language can completely change a conversation. Um, and, and very much linked to the sort of work Julie Stern's doing with concept-based learning. What do you understand by the word war? What do you understand by the word compassion and well-being? And, everybody looks at those different words and those ideas with a very, very different lens. Um, and Steve Salis talked about that in many, many episodes ago. That you, you can't get into somebody else's head. You can only ask questions to try and understand them as best you can. And the lens that they have on certain aspects of what you do and how you do it is going to be very, very different. And you've got to take the time to try and work that out. Um, and, and one of the things that I thought is really key in that is that use of language and what we understand by language so there, there are a few things that i would certainly pull out as real moments where i thought wow you know they're, they're not only fantastic conversations but some some really cool takeaways so i, I find it really interesting i mean i think yeah i think they're great takeaways i think there's some really sort of interesting themes that kind of run through this and we keep coming back to relationships um I'm kind of getting into this real thinking about, I, I agree with sense of self, and it's a very difficult thing to do to know yourself really well. And unfortunately, the older you get, the better you know yourself and you wish you knew yourself as well as you know yourself now when you were younger. And, you know, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's something that everybody's talked about for, 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 for years and years. But I think it's so tightly connected with relationships and sense of belonging. Um, and then I, then I start to begin to think about a conversation I recently had with a head teacher that I'm doing some work with about how their teachers, how they how, sort of thinking about how the leadership interacts with the, uh, with the teachers. And I kind of said to him, look, think about a great classroom. What does it look like? You know, and, and, and what are the relationships between the kids in that classroom and the kids and the teacher? And what's the stuff that's being taught and all of those things. And it, and when you start thinking about leadership like that, that, that starts big for me, beginning to frame the type of um, type of environment, climate you want in the school. You've, you've talked a lot about people walking with head down and people not wanting to connect and people. And it, it reminded me of a of a, a great a great phrase that, that, that Rebecca Allen's wife um, shared with me when we were at Garden, and she and she kind of said, "Look, you know, if if being in school and teaching isn't part of your well being, you're kind of in the wrong business." You know what I mean? They're not, they're not two separate. For me, they can't be two separate things because I don't feel like many people went into education to make money. Um, they did it because they care and they did it because they have a passion, which leads me to my other little thought. And I think we're, we're edging around this as well. It's about that sense of purpose. It's about what, what makes us do what we do. And, and the fact we just constantly walk past it as leaders and teachers and we move on to the next problem. And if we can center in on how that sense of purpose manifests itself day in, day out. And then all of a sudden, our sense of self, our sense of belonging, our capacity to relate to others starts becoming stronger. You know, that idea, the one thing I would take out of this year is trying to get people to live in the moment more um, because we can do very little about what's coming at the moment. Um, those things sort of resonate with me as you were talking, Lewis. And, and, and they were, I think when you, when you speak, we all have confirmation bias, don't we? So we pull the bits we like and we, we start to sort of connect them into our schemas. Um, and, and those are things that kind of sort of came around that. And the other thing I thought that was really interesting is this, this idea of leadership. We, we need to be liked as leaders because it's unlikely people are going to 
um, are going to follow us. We want to be liked because we're human beings. Nobody likes being disliked. You know, that's 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 our nature. But we've also got to cope with the fact that everyone's going to like us. And that's it sounds like an oxymoron, but it's a reality. Um, and and I, and I don't know what the answer is there, but I think it is striving to be liked. And I think it is recognizing it's important to be liked, but it's also accepting that not everyone's going to like you. And I think that's that's a challenging thing. And my final word is, isn't that exactly what we want? Isn't everything we're talking about what we want for our kids in school? You know, um, and I, I just don't get, you know, we, I don't get where schools have a vision for kids and a vision for staff. Because in the end, every time I've gone through this process, I've looked at one vision and gone, well, that's actually for kids and staff and looked at the other, you know, and it's about, an, it's about a sort of a, an organisation or community or whatever we want, want to call it, set of values that are agreed and we work towards um yeah anyway just some thoughts from me as you were speaking but obviously a very very impactful sort of uh 52 episodes i'm gonna hand over to alan now um and to to continue that sort of theme of what he's taken out of it apart from managing skateboard without getting injured which i'm not entirely sure i'd be able to do <laughs> <laughs> just, just you talking there and summarizing simon who teaches all of this i it's completely experiential isn't it like who teaches us how to do these things? It's like there's no courses, there's no preparation, there's there's nothing that prepares you for these situations that we're talking about. So I find that really interesting concept to to look forward to in the future. I would I would say this to you, Alan. I, I, the one thing I the one thing I have loved doing this year, and I, I started doing it at, at your school prior to your arrival, and have carried on doing it here, is I've, I've begun to teach a, 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 a teach deliver facilitate whatever you want to call it a sorry a little bit of self-promotion um <laughs> small small advert coming but but leading with well-being in mind and it's really about exploring those things and it's that oxygen mask thing start with yourself get yourself sorted because if you're not sorted you're not going to sort others and then looking at how leadership theory kind of interfaces with with trying to create the climate and environment and and i'll say this as well lewis i don't think schools where people don't interact well will actually educate kids well that's my that's my personal opinion if we're not doing it as adults if it's not part of our climate if we haven't got the climate right and all the research in cognitive science and all the research coming out of uh, groups like PISA is saying this we're not going to get learning right you know it's that that joke about you can be a great teacher but no learning can go on it's not really a joke it's a tragedy um it only goes on when those kids are receptive to learning and I think well-being is the next assessment for learning and I think people are beginning to recognise that, but I think it, it's not it's not highly time consuming, but it does make us it, it forces us all to rethink our interactions and, and our purpose. And so those are the things I'd say. Um, and the answer, Alan, is you just you just got to set people on a journey, haven't you, and keep nudging yeah. it in the right direction and throwing things on top. But again, it links with the vision you've got for what you're trying to do, um, and you have to disregard the things that maybe don't meet that vision and I think that's the lovely bit about leadership theory is when I look at it I look at some of it and I go that that just for me in a school with a, in a people-based industry that is not good theory for me yeah. because the net result of that is I'm going to damage the environment and the climate that we work in and, and if that's what I'm doing then I'm damaging what I think is most important uh, it doesn't mean it's not good leadership theory it just means in this context it, we shouldn't go near it yeah no, anyway. I, I fully agree it's a uh, and, and then Darcy Lund talked about this, Simon, where he's doing it from a service learning perspective, but no one size yeah. fits all. It, it, he, lo- he used a lovely phrase that we've sort of adopted where the context provides the narrative. Uh, yeah. and, and I think it's, that is so important. And I'm, I'm, find so, I'm finding out so much about that on my course. And that, that, that aspect there of um, kindness that you've talked about Laurie Comer had a lovely expression where she said that kind words can change someone's day. You just don't know what's going on in everybody's head. And just that little positive hello in a morning, how you doing, how, how, how's the kids, or have a good day, that can lighten someone's mood just in an instant. And, and I thought she put that really, really lovely, which sort of lends in well to, to Aaron Walsh and Logan O'Brien, who have developed a, a mental skills program, which you'd actually be really interested in, Simon. They've t- they've dragged it down. Aaron Walsh is, is a is a highly sought after psychologist actually in in New Zealand, and and he's brought his work across to the UK with Lorcan in the Dulwich Group, 
and and they've come up with a mental skills program for their high performing athletes and then they're trying to drag it down into a into a well-being curriculum which is very interesting to talk about a lot that we don't agree with a lot that we do agree with but the fact that they're trying is a really positive uh, aspect of lockdown my other some of my other takeaways from my my, my current boss helen old she she talks about this and it, and it resonated with me is that you're never given more than what you're capable of and and people will often see the potential in you that you don't see in yourself and i think you you're very apt in that Simon in in the potential that you saw in, in in Lewis and I as well and how you then develop that I don't know if you just want to share anything on that I think it's quite a good little point for you to come in I love the Nelson Mandela quote there's this great and it's I don't know it's, I haven't read Nelson Mandela to death I've read his autobiography but there's a great piece in Invictus where he's talking to uh, Francois Pino and he asks Francois Pino what he thinks leadership is and Francois Pino says it's about getting the best out of people and Nelson Mandela kind of thinks for a moment. He said, well, I actually think it's about getting people to realise that they can be better than they realise they are. Yeah. And I think that's that's the game. And I just thought that was that's one of the most sort of aspirational um, thoughts I've had for leadership. And I kind of, you know, we you, going right back to your chat about where you started and where you, where you are now. And, and, and you've heard me say this a lot, you know, Never in a million years would I expect to be where I am now or, or, or do what I do now or, 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 you know, have these things because they just weren't even on my horizon. Um, and, it, and often I look at myself and I kind of look, look like, I think, was, what was that thing called? The accidental tourist? You know, I've kind of <laughs> arrived, I've arrived here, not by design. I've never really looked more than a year or two ahead. Um, and I don't, don't think I really ever had, had the aspirations to be a leader, but I probably ended up having a personality type that, that ended up getting me where I and when I say that I say that in a in a negative way in some ways because it's kind of looking up the ladder and thinking well I think I could probably do that a bit better which is my competitive side um, and I often and this is a terrible thing to say I, I have some reservation about people who are kind of panning their life out for leadership at the age of mid-20s and kind of just you know slow down and, and quite often people who get into leadership positions aren't necessarily the people that should be there they're just people who've tried to get there. Um, those are just sort of some, some minor thoughts. An yeah, I mean, I... There's an interesting paradox in, in some ways there, then, because I, I think I agree with what, what Helen said in terms of, I, don't th I think her point was very much, you never think that you're ready. And if, yeah. if, 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 you, if you do think you're ready, you've probably left a little bit too long. And that comes in then to play with that comparison you made, Simon, of, well, if you're thinking too far ahead and that's what you're going to go for, you know, slow down. So it's it's trying to get that that scale right, isn't it? Of I'm learning, I'm doing, I'm growing. Right, an opportunity has come along. The frogs walked past, if you like, and right now I've got an opportunity to go on to do something that is out of my comfort zone that I am a little bit scared about. But I'm going to go and attack that with some vigor, rather than than letting that pass and think, well, it wasn't the right time for that. I didn't do it, and then regretting it later. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a conversation with someone yesterday and they were talking about how it's been leading the school. And, and I kind of reflected, I've never ever thought I've been leading a school. I've never really had that feeling of I'm responsible for 1,750 kids and, you know, 1,200 families and 250 to 300 staff. I don't, just don't view it like that. I can't. I think that would just completely overwhelm me and I'd be a, a blithering mess. So I just, I just come to work and do my best. Um, you know, and I think that's probably something you're hearing from, you know, the, you know, that, 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 that whether it's a right thing or a wrong thing, if you're trying to do the right thing, it can't be wrong. And I think that's the only way to approach these things is you, you, you have your vision and then you just, you just, you, you deal with each day at a time. And, you know, when life gets at its toughest, all you can do is take the next step forward and the next step forward and the next step forward. There was a great piece of research around, um, they put a series of athletes and people through the, uh, Navy SEAL training in the US and they took high they put a group of high performing athletes through who all failed um, and what they deduced from it was that high performing athletes have long term goals and to get through really tough stuff like Navy SEAL training you can't have long term goals all you can have is a series of very short term goals I'm going to take another 50 steps I'm going to get up this morning I'm going and there's a great um, documentary about uh, Steve, Stephen Redgrave the, uh, the rower 
when he found out he got diabetes and it was the same. And he spent four years setting himself 30 second goals to get himself back to the Olympics, you know? And I think there's a lot of that about leadership. I think we kind of, we can get wrapped up in the enormity of it. And really all it is, is, is trying to do the right thing day by day. Um, yeah. And reflecting and thinking about what it is you're trying to get out of it and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. No, yeah. I don't know. I, I think I've got, I think I've gone off the edge of what you actually asked me. About. No, no, I, I think it, it's great conversations and it, and it, it just brings me back to, to what Liz Cloak talked about, trying not to turn down opportunities. And, I, yeah. and, I, and I'm linking yeah. back to, as I've gone through, I, Lewis just talked there about maybe waiting, it's too late. I don't think it's ever too late. I think there's I think there's a time when you're ready. You might not think you're ready, but you can, or you might get put into something early. And I remember you talking to me about when you got your first head ship. Well, if you looked at it rationally, you probably weren't ready, were you? But you just did it and you cracked on anyway. So... I think there's it, timing. It timing is 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 great, and and looking at seminal moments. There's there's been so many instances of seminal moments in our podcasts, and people going one way or going another. And and I know you put a really cool tweet out last week, Lewis, and you got some great responses. I don't know if you want to share any of those. I don't think I've ever got a great response to a tweet. Which one are you on about? <laughs> <laughs> The seminal moments one, I thought was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Just this idea that everybody has these life-changing moments, like the film Sliding Doors. I think I put on the picture of Sliding Doors because yeah. it makes it sort of relatable to people. But throughout your life, you have a series of decisions that you make that maybe at the time you're not 100% sure why you made them, but looking back, they've really set the narrative of where your life has gone. Um, you know, and, and, and for me... There, there was several. One of them was was getting in touch with you, Alan, in Manila and saying, you know what, I'm, I'm dis disillusioned with work in the UK. I want to work somewhere else. And then what that led to. Um, and another big one for me in terms of um, starting to focus on myself and understand myself and, and look after myself was the, the tragic suicide at BSM some years ago. You know, it was a really tough time for 12 months or so after that. And I know certainly for you as, as a the school leader at the time, Simon, that was, um, um, you know, deaths of, 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 of people that are relations, you know, really inspirational grandmas and granddads, you know, was was really tough for me. And, 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 and these aren't things that are unique to, to one person. You know, everybody has these moments through their lives that, that make them stop and reevaluate. We're in one at the moment, aren't we? With, yeah, yeah, with, with where we're at and uh, yeah we've got lots of really cool honest sort of responses to that and, and they were nice to hear what are yours Alan have you got a couple uh, that, that, that spring to mind Phil Mathis remember Phil Mathis when he he was a paper salesman yeah. and he, he didn't want to do it but he's got this I like the analogy he used where we're always selling something and that's so applicable to, to leadership and, and to teaching as well is that we're always selling something and he, he went into teaching and now that's his passion and his love. And I, I really love that idea. And yeah, I had them seminal moments of where Rebecca and I, we were we didn't particularly enjoy the school we were working at in the UK. And we got a message saying, well, there's a school opening in Spain. So from a friend of a friend, would you fancy putting a CV in and going and have a look? Went and had a look and that was it. Bish, bash, bosh. Off you go, go and live in Spain, never never work back in the UK. And there is these little moments, isn't there, throughout your life. You move into Manila, moving out here to Riyadh, moving to Qatar, there's all having kids, they're all they're all moments by which you, your life is completely changed. And I know I know our guest Richard Oppenheim, who's going through one of those moments at the moment where he's going from a deputy ambassador to suddenly now being the ambassador for Yemen. Now, there's a lot going on in Yemen at the moment. And he, this guy, he, he's been in Iraq. He's been all over the place. He loves being in a, in a hot spot. But he says that's where opportunities happen, is where other people might not go. And I, and I love that. He just took a chance, takes the opportunity, and he grows from that. And I think a, a, a big thing, that the big theme that's gone through is really just putting yourself in that situation. You might not be, feel comfortable. You might not feel as if you're ready. But just have a go, and and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to get it wrong. That was Stephen Jones's motto. I think. Um, I think they're for me. I think putting yourself in those opportunities reminds me of the conversation we had with Maxine Blake. Uh, Maxine Blake's a, an author of a very funny book, 
done who in the pudding bowl or something similar. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, and she's a retired teacher from Sheffield. Um, and she she talked about as a as a as a, a young black female being a teacher who really val valued taking children onto OEA trips. And she took a group of um, a group of girls who had never been anywhere out of the city that they lived in to go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, to go kayaking. And um, they, she'd put the, the kayaks on the concrete floor with the uh, with the oars, and these children had, had sat in the kayaks on the concrete with the oars, being like, well, how does it move? How do we do it? And she's like, no, no, it, it needs to go into the river <laughs> And I just thought that was absolutely outstanding. But it's just putting yourself in those opportunities where sometimes... You haven't got a clue, you know, you don't know the answer and, and you know, that's all right. That's all right in some instances. It's certainly in other instances it's not, you know, but, but it, that, that's all right in some instances and you can go and you can be open to learning and, and you can sort of progress as you go and maybe you're not quite ready, but you, you've got enough of the skills to be able to work that out and work that out well as you go. So isn't, isn't, that job as, isn't that our job as leaders and teachers, though, is to put kids and other people in those opportunities? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I had this... Um, I had this amazing little email from a, it was a message on LinkedIn, actually. We had this, when I was in South Auckland, I, I can't remember, it was a chance meeting with someone who worked with Outward Bound. And um, he said, he said, I, and I said to him, God, some of the kids I work with would just benefit so greatly from that course. And it's pretty brutal in New Zealand. It's a month and it's, you finish by running a half marathon and you, you get put on a 48 hour solo. You know, it's not a, it, it, you know, it's, 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 a t it's a tough gig. Um, and I don't know, one way or another, he said, look, you know, every so often we get people pull at the last minute and everything's paid for. And if you can get someone to me within like 10 days, um, sometimes as few as five days, then, then those places are there. They're paid for and we, they won't, they'll be empty. And for about four years, we had this opportunity about twice a year. And we just sit down and think about who we sent on. Um, and, and I absolutely know for some of those kids, that was life changing. Um, there was a lad who got in touch with me. Well, a lad is a, a man who got in touch with me who ended up being a PE teacher in, uh, overseas, an international school PE teacher, Mariyuka Hilling. And, and I remember him coming back and saying, I'm going to be a teacher. He said, it's, 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 I'm, I'm going to push myself to be a teacher. Um, and, I, and, and I got this amazing little email from a, from a, a girl that I taught who basically said, this saved my life. You know, I would never have picked that. She told me a, a backstory that I knew some of, but, but the actual backstory was greater than the story I understood. And she's now in Canada working for, uh, working for Lululemon and, and, and it's transformed her life. Um, you know, so I think sometimes our job is to, is to drop people into those. Uh, and when I say saved a life, I mean saved a life. She was, she was on, she, she'd attempted suicide. She was on the verge of, you know, and, and in an incredibly challenging uh, home personal situation. Um, of which I knew parts, but not all. So you get these moments, and I think maybe, and those are the magic moments. Those are the moments that you kind of live for as an educator. For me, um, you know, seeing other people move on. But uh, uh, those things, I think that, you know, as you talk about those seminal moments, it's kind of worth us thinking that our job's to put kids into seminal moments and our job's to, to help colleagues jump into seminal moments. And uh, I think seminal moments are only seminal reflectively. We probably, <laughs> we probably had a multitude of, seminal moments that didn't turn out the way we expected, you know, and, and, and actually only become seminal moments because something else happened. And mine's probably uh, Kim forcing me to apply for a job at Garden that I wasn't going to apply for that I ended up getting, you know, those would be seminal moments. But I could also, there were probably about another 30 applications that I didn't even get a blink on that would have been my seminal moments. I had no I hadn't got one of those. So, you know, I think this. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Very true. Yeah. Oh, it's been a great how long we've we been just over an hour it's been a great conversation I want to finish I want to finish with just a, a short a short little reflection from you both okay. Lewis Lewis what, what what next then on the leadership journey I'm not talking about your career I'm talking about what what are the things you really want to go at for the uh, for the next 12 months and maybe uh, I've got this little one who would you like to who would you like to interview and I kind of think one of it's one person on both your lists that you'd like to have a fun there um but yeah, what, so what, what are we looking forward to the next 52 weeks of infinite uh, learners? What, what, what's next? Um, for, for, for the podcast, I think, I think we were exploring more of the same. I think the more we go through 
and we speak to different people in different contexts, the more we start to find common themes. And I think what we're going to start to do over the, the next 52 weeks is really start to look into those themes in a little bit more detail and maybe look at the research of those and look at some really contextual examples. Um, and I'm really excited about that. I think that'll be a really cool journey. I think that'll really deepen our knowledge and it'll, it'll allow some really fun and really insightful conversations with people. And, and Alan and I have always said right from the start, you know, if we if we get one person getting in touch with us every now and again that says, listen, I, I enjoyed that podcast and it helped me a bit, you know, that's worth its weight in gold. Alan and I are having great conversations every week. And if one person can benefit from them, that's brilliant. And while ever we feel that that's happening and we're getting that feedback, you know, we will continue to have them. Um, I think for, for me personally, in terms of my development, um, I've, I've really started to understand, as I alluded to right at the beginning, this idea of not knowing all the answers is all right. Um, that, that's fine. It's, it, leadership isn't about knowing the answers. And I, and I think I had a misperception of that in the past, that you were expected to, knowledge was really important. I do think knowledge is important, but I think listening and being collaborative and taking on board different ideas um, and, and supporting staff to, to see their ideas come to fruition is just as important. And, and for me, certainly that idea of listening, that idea of taking time to reflect is something that I've become better at during this last 12 months or so, um, and something that I'd really like to develop going forward through exploring different kinds of coaching, through real life situations, you know, being, being in the role and, and doing what you do each and every day, it's never predictable. There's, there's always something happening somewhere, um, someone that needs support or, or some situation that needs your attention. Um, and as much as that is difficult during this time of, of, of not being in and around people as much as I'd like, that also gives you lots of lessons. And I think that in the future, you know, we'll all stop and take a, a breath and think, wow, you know, COVID changed the world and it, and it changed our perspective on it. Um, and, and, I, and I see that maybe a fraction of it of, of that change now and, and, and I think that the other 90-95% of that will come in years to come when things do return to normal. We always look back on things with rosier coloured spectacles and the ones we view them through at the time you know yeah. that's uh, and, and you're right I think that little bit of chaos and that little bit of disruption when we've had time to let it settle and think back on it will I'm hoping it really just drives the wellbeing agenda. That would be my one hope for the world is it really just drives the concept that this is actually, has to be central to the way in which we approach education. Yeah, I think on, on, the, on the wellbeing side of things, I think the other thing I'd add is, is just taking some time to understand that, that wellbeing, I don't think is largely understood um, as well as it could be. And, and I think that, again, going back to that sort of, tyranny of words that people will perceive it as completely different things and, and without having a collective understanding of what well-being is it will be a very individual and a very independent experience for people and it's taking the time to understand what that means to someone but in the same okay. way in, in our roles as leaders in organizations trying to make sure that it's a common language that is understood in some respect as well and, and that partnership of well-being and with teaching and learning is one that I think is really, really important to look on in terms of research and development over the coming years. Is, you know, Maslow before Bloom and all that, and, and, and that's been a big phrase, hasn't it, during COVID, let's look after each other's needs and put our own oxygen mask on before we try anything else. And I think there's some truth in that, but I'll also challenge that idea and say that, you know, I, I don't think you get those relationships with children and with staff and, and with colleagues and parents unless there is some learning there or unless there is some mutual respect and development and progress you know you can go around all day long praising kids and giving them high fives but actually they're not going to have much respect for you until you teach them something and i think there's got to be a partnership of that as we move forward and, and that 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 perspective has, has come from years of of being very much a kind of person who would put well-being and pastoral care ahead of teaching and learning um and, and the last couple of years certainly as as stopped me or at least challenged my thinking and allowed me to take some time and look at the other side of it and think well actually no I think there is a bigger picture and they're both so so important and moving forward for me I think that's that's one thing I want to explore yeah and I mean I, I agree I, and I, I would just place challenge challenge and challenge at the center of the things that come out that support well-being 
Um, <clears throat> and without it, we're not really the people we, we'd like to be and our sense of self won't be there because we won't have any sense of achievement. Um, and we only feel a sense of achievement when we overcome commensurate challenges. So I, I agree. And also I think the well-being piece, Maslow's not well-being, you know, and that's, and that's you know, well-being is for everybody and it's about improving the way in which we experience our lives. And quite often well-being is just talked about as the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, which is absolutely critical. But well-being is more than that in my mind. Um, and and I agree with you. We've got to kind of we've got to reframe well-being because it's just being bandied about, and, and every yeah. every everybody who fancies having a punt at talking about well-being is beginning to have a chat about well-being, um, and that's not a bad thing. But I think it's got to sit back with research, and the research is there. Um, you know, I think you're right. I don't think it is a bad thing. I think there's so much potential now for people to speak out and be vulnerable about mental health, about challenges, about anxiety about depression and everything else that comes with it, whether whether there is a category of a medical condition or not, just people talking about the things that they find difficult. I think it's such a healthy environment at the minute and the way that that's going. I like the idea of the kayak on the concrete without getting wet. I quite like that, but that's something I'll come to later. All right, Alan, finish yourself. Yeah, the it's interesting talking about well-being there and then... I'm very much interested in looking at school culture, being in a new school and developing a culture. Some I don't think people fully understand what culture is in a, in a team context and developing a culture. So that's that's going to be my one of my big aims going into the new year when everybody's back in the building. We hope uh, and learning about connection and how what type of school do we want to create? That that's that's massive. It's much harder in schools that are established, but. I think all the staff have a responsibility to, to, to contribute to that. So, well, hang on a minute. If we've created these, this set of almost values, well, we can hold people accountable if they're not conforming to our, to our values. And, and we can, leaders don't have to do that. Everybody can be a leader and say, hang on, you're not, you're not conforming to what we've said we want to be. Do you realise that? And then we can adjust behaviours. So I'd love to get involved in that. And that's something that I'm looking at in, in the inset period. Um, I think from a personal perspective, I, I've got to, I'm, I'm, I'm very similar. We're all very similar in that we want things done here and now. And I've, I've got to learn to be patient. I, I've realised that Rome wasn't built in a day. Not my fault, I know, I know, but <laughs> you think about what we built over a, a significant time period. I can't have that here and now. That's going to take five, six, seven, maybe even up to a 10 year project. And I just, I have to check in with myself to remember a lot. I can't, why haven't we got this, this and that? Well, we're not ready yet. And we haven't got the, we haven't got the capabilities. We haven't got the staffing. We haven't got the facilities. And, and just remembering that. And, and it's a long-term vision that, that I want to be part of. So that, that's, that, that's it for me, really. And, and I think in terms of the podcast, I, I love what we're doing with it. And, and as, as much as we're learning all the time, and I think that's the key to this, is that learning something every week, and learning from different people and then putting it into the mix and using bits that I want to use, don't use bits that I don't want to use and, and get into the real bottom and brass tacks of these key things that Lewis is talking about. What is, what is the benefits of empathy in, in the workplace? Really going down that line and, and, and being a deeper understanding of it, of what we can do. But a really good year, really enjoyed it. And you know what? I'd have never thought we could have done this. And, and you know what? We have. So... Brilliant. There, there is that moment in there where we just laughed at ourselves when we said we were going to write an article. We're like, well, it just get ripped to shreds. It'll be rubbish. Then we laughed at ourselves and we we're going to do a podcast. Um, and it maybe has got ripped to shreds and it is rubbish. <laughs> who, who knows? But I tell you what, you know, it, it just gives you that perspective and it gives you that opportunity to, to really start to understand yourself and, and the reasons why you do things a little bit more. And uh, Simon, we're dead appreciative of your time and for coming on and, and sort of facilitating a conversation with us. So, it, it wasn't just me and Alan Rabbit in on leash. He kept us up, kept us on track. Hey, it's absolutely my pleasure. And I just want to finish with one word about conforming. And, and, and I think what Alan's talking about is less, less about conforming, but actually sharing a value system. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there has to be agency in the classroom. There has to be agency in the school. And, and it's not, it's not about everyone doing the same thing. It's about everybody working towards a similar set of values and goals and, and if we, if we even tie ourselves down to those exact goals, and as we've said, you know, if you look at what happened at BSM, where we started and where we finished were two different things. What we wanted to do wasn't 
terribly different, but the values and the and the, and the goals changed, and, and and that's the beauty of it. You know, as you said, Lewis. You know, you begin doing this, and it becomes something that you didn't expect, and that's the beauty of it. And you've got to. It's kind of letting go and. And pulling in, it's that it's that when to rein it in and when to push it out. But I, I would just uh, finish up by saying, huge congratulations to both of you. You know, we, we, I've, I've always loved working with you, and it's fantastic to be able to keep this connection and uh, and fantastic seeing you studying, Alan, seeing you both flourishing in new roles and, and taking on something like this podcast. In addition, so uh, well done. And uh, who knows what the next 52 uh, <laughs> weeks will bring. But if I'm still alive and kicking, maybe we can uh, reflect on them again in about what would it be? Uh, beginning of June 2022. Wow. I mean, who knows what that will look and feel like. Hopefully oh, it's wow. COVID free, eh? That would be nice. Yeah. I tell you, I've said this a number of times. Talking about COVID a bit like talking about the weather when I was a kid. Everyone's, <laughs> everyone's got a theory, but no one's right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll leave you at that, Simon. Top man, thanks. Cheers, guys. Bye.